guys, how you guys doing out there? It's Solar Gray, the cinematic sorcerer. And again, that was a real big apology on my side. I'm like, <laughs> all right, we're going live. We got everything set up. Um, as you guys know, I have been doing a whole lot of revamping and redoing equipment over here in the Wizard's Tower. And of course, as I'm doing all that jazz, I ended up getting a really nice set of headphones, um, I think from the Stickman. So yeah. when I pushed the thing, I was hearing the music coming out of my lap, which is where my headphones are, but it's also where the computer that has the theme music is. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, am I plugged into the right thing? But any what's it on that note, I am, ooh, I am not coming in properly. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Nope, 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 nope. Let me try this again. Boom. Ah! Ah, ah. <laughs> this is yeah. This is not going well. This is not going very well. Hello, listeners. This is yeah. the Dig Duggernaut <laughs> talking to you live as well, the cinematic sorcerer tries to do some sorcery over there. Yeah. Again, my um my spells aren't going great right now. You know. Oh ah uh, ah. Uh. Okay, a so little bit of okay. wizardry can go a lot of bit wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you guys are going to, yeah. Well, again, just trying to get this stuff down properly. Mm. Let me try this again. Switch it up. Hi. Yeah, hey. Yeah, he's here with me, too. Hey! <laughs> hey <guys. laughs> ah! Yep. Ah, see? See, I'm not the only one. I guess we have a thing happening here in the Wizard's Tower right yeah, now. Yeah, I was going to say, we got some we got some uh, spirits that are making some trouble here or something. Yeah. Uh, oh. Ooh, ah. <laughs> ah. Oh, oh, almost had it there. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah, again, we normally go through all this stuff, but we had a bit of a power problem coming out. Um, yeah, that, oh, look at that. Woo, woo, woo! And, um, yeah, just a little bit of a power problem. Anyway, you guys know who we are. <laughs> <laughs> and all that stuff. I'm Solar Gray, the cinematic sorcerer. Um, coming at you today with my good friend. The Dig Dugger <laughs> Yeah. Who, so needs, who needs title cards when we're just so enthusiastic? That's right, that's right. But the power is mine! It's yours? All yeah. right. Although I have no idea how to wield it sometimes. So, <laughs> um, welcome to the Game Gallery, where where we talk about games, a lot of game theory, but not in a very, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, not in a very espionage sense. Yes, no espionage, espionage. Um, <laughs> game theory, I see. Yeah, well, you know, that that's, uh, talk about game mechanics and stuff like see, that. See, it's funny, I, I uh, had a friend of mine uh, that I was telling to come watch the stream, uh, and her, her handle is espionage. So, oh, yeah. You know, that's actually a funny thing because I was about to give a shout out to Espionage um, for subscribing. So thank you. Thank oh, you very much. yeah, there you yeah, go. I got the email this morning and it was like, Espionage, now following you on Twitch. I'm like, yes. <laughs> what is that? I don't know. That's awesome. Yeah, a friend yeah. of mine who I was like, yeah, you should, you should totally subscribe to our channel. It's a thing we do. <laughs> yeah. well, She's sweetness. awesome. Yeah, sweetness, sweetness. Yeah. You know. Um, however, there is a thing, you know, since we're here and all that stuff, I want to say hello, hello, and thank you guys over there for showing up in NP City. How you Woo! Doing, NP City! City. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, um, yeah, I want to say hey to you guys. Oh my, God. see, it's really hard to switch back and forth between that stuff without ending up in a large cornucopia. Yeah. yeah. I, I was noticing that. I was like, how, how many layers deep can we go on that? Uh, a lot. A lot, a yeah. Lot. Just the, the infinitely regressive mirror. Yes, the answer is a lot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so again, thank you for showing up today. That Absolutely. A really cool thing. And I got to say, um, with you guys out there, you guys know this is coming. I try and get it out of the way as quickly <laughs> at the beginning of the episode as I can. But since, you know, since the Dig Duggernaut is here. That's true. I am here. Since, you know, NP City is here and representing, I got to say, if you want to join and all that jazz, then that's cool. Come on down. 
um, to twitch.tv. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, just come on over, you know, subscribe and do all that jazz. And um, you will be put on the announcement list, um, Instagram, <laughs> um, when we put out the announcement of when we're going to go live. But if you guys um, have some, if you got something to say to me, you, you, you want to say something to me? You want to say something to him? Me? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, him. Yeah. Him or me or any of the other co-hosts, that's fine. Just uh, pull up a keyboard and type in back in the deck at gmail.com. Oh my god, we owe oh, it. Yeah, that's better. Uh, yeah, back in the deck at gmail.com. <laughs> yeah, we got ooh, we're just I was gonna say we got we got spirits. So let's see if we can do this one more time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Huh. That is being a little weird, a little weird. Oh, no wonder it's being a little weird. <laughs> As I was saying, uh, just there we go. Pull up a keyboard um, and type in back in the deck at gmail.com. B a c k i n p h a b c k at gmail.com. Um, follow us on YouTube if you like all this calamity in the same way that I do. <laughs> oh my God, do I like this calamity? Um, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna erase those things on the mixer. Um, if you are digging the calamities like I do and all that, all that, all that stuff, follow us on Twitter where I like, you know, scream going, oh my god, I couldn't get my mix of marker, blah, 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 blah. And, um, yeah, follow us on Twitter at Back on the Deck. Join the Facebook group, Deckers on the Book, and that wretched hive of scum and villainy that we know as Facebook. Yeah, I got some, got some impending stuff going to be going up on there. And, um, yeah, if you like listening to our voices and like hanging with our conversations, conversations and all that stuff and don't have the time to see us live that's perfectly fine as a matter of fact you can just listen to us while you drive while you're in the shower while you're babysitting let us talk to your children you know that that's what we can do we can just head on over to the soundcloud at soundcloud.com slash bid underscore p and of course follow us on instagram at back in the deck that's the at symbol not the ampersand because i like saying that word but that's the thing that says and but the at symbol whose name i will figure out one of these days um at back in the deck b-a-c-k-i-n-t-h-e-b-e-c-k and of course we really love having you guys here we love doing this stuff for you you know this is the stuff that kind of gets our motor running and all that jazz and we're happy happy to do it but if you guys want to help us out and you guys want to say hey how can we make sure that these guys shows can get better the source work isn't always exhausted from working 15 <laughs> job um that's easy just head on over to patreon and um you know, for as little as one dollar a month, and it does help. It really does help a lot. Yeah. Um, you can join our Patreon. You'll have full access to the archive. I have been killing myself uploading these things one video at a time, trying to keep them in order, doing all the copy, and that's just for the one dollar guys. Our tiers go all the way up, all the way up to. Oh, that's better. Yeah, our tears go all the way up to, oh my god, how far do they go? They go all the way up to $100. So anywhere from $1 to $100, you can help us out over at Back in the Deck or at patreon.com slash bid underscore p. And I am redesigning the website to make it look a little less cartoonish and a lot easier to navigate for you guys. Um, so once I get done with that, I'll start putting that in this segment of, of the advertisements of the show and all that stuff. Um, so all the ways that we are trying to get out the content to you. And, oh, well, that's easy. Oh, look at that. There we go. And, you know, all that stuff to all the things that we are doing to make sure that we can get the content to you and that you can join us in Geek 2.0 and make sure that everybody has a place at the table. Just not at the head because it's not a, it's not that shape of a table. So, um, I, all right. So now we're back. We are back. We are bad. And technical difficulties aside, we are back. We are here. So, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I I am <clears throat> stressed as all get out preparing for Kingdom Con because Ooh. 
Why, yeah. Kingdom Con? What's that? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, Solar. Uh, Kingdom Con is the premier gaming convention in Southern California, down in uh, down in beautiful, sunny San Diego, California, next weekend, April 11th through 14th. Wow. Yeah. It almost sounds like there's going to be things like gamers playing board games and role-playing games and tabletop miniatures games. It is It is a non-electronic gaming expo. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. It is entire, well, I shouldn't say entirely. They do sneak a few electronic things in there, um, but not much. It's, uh, the only electronic game I can think of is, you ever heard of the game Artemis? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, a, it's, me it's some Artemis. Yeah, it's like basically a bridge simulator. So usually sometime at night, they'll throw it up on a wall outside and everyone gets, uh, shall we say, a little toasty. And then you have, uh, you have That's somebody. That's a different channel. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, people people let the libations flow a bit, and then uh, they all sit down and play some Artemis together. And, but that's about the only electronic thing. Everything else is board games, miniatures games, role playing games, and I mean it. If you can imagine any sort of non electronic gaming, you can probably find it there in some form or another. I mean, they've got historical games. And I'm talking about like the weird ones from 40 <laughs> years ago. Like somebody will dig out a rule set for that. And wow, it's almost like. It's almost like people don't remember Avalon Hill games. <laughs> I'm talking about like like the weird like Peter Pig games where <laughs> you're uh, you're you're playing uh, you know Soviet funded African warlords with uh, oh no I'm talking they they get weird and obscure. Wow, I yeah. actually might start playing. I, I'm gonna have to find a table like that so that I can just look at someone going look at me no look at me yeah look at me look I'm the captain I'm the captain now. Look at me. Look, look, look at me. Yeah. yeah. No, they, they've got great rules like, uh, you know, if you're playing, uh, you know, you're playing certain certain factions, you never know who's loyal to you. So before each battle, you have to purge all of the uh, the, on, the unloyal people. But there's only about a one-third chance you purge the right people. So sometimes it makes your morale worse, and sometimes it actually helps things. It's, oh, yeah, it, it, it's a weird game. But anyway, there's there's always, all kinds of stuff. Always purge the right people to purge. Yeah. Always. Well, sometimes you, sometimes you get it wrong, and then you make a lot of people upset. You know, just you gotta be careful when you're purging, man. If you say that, I, you will be purged. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You will be cleansed. Uh, but no, I got I got a buddy who was really excited about that particular game. But anyway, they got all kinds of games there. Uh, they got the big ones, of course, Warhammer and War Machine. They have great big tournaments for those. Uh, Friday is going to be a you know 12 to 14 hour Warhammer Apocalypse game I'm going to be participating in. So if you want to come see an absurd, uh, what's going to be one entire side of the board is going to be orcs. It's going to be a massive orc invasion, and oh, it's going to be hilarious. I'm really excited for it. But oh, uh, very cool. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be there too. That's doing right. Doing interviews and talking with game creators and of course maybe even getting my butt kicked at a game or two there that's all going to be on camera well i've got some friends who are very excited to play game of thrones board game and i know how you feel about that one so i'm i have no idea what you mean yeah it's almost like game of thrones is a ladder <laughs> it's a ladder and some people may some people may they they just may concentrate on the throne or on the birds but only the ladder is real that is all <laughs> Climbing to the next rung. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, I, I like varies. I, I, I know, <laughs> I know. You, you, and Littlefinger and varies are, are, you know, you're all about that scheming. Where, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say scheming. I, I like would. to say, <laughs> I like to say long-term plans for the betterment of the largest amount of. Okay, fine, it's scheming. Yeah, I was going to say, All no, right. it, it's just scheming, you know. I'm just out here trying to make sure that everyone knows that uh, debts are repaid in full by anyone who incurs them. And uh, we'll, we'll see who else is at the table and, and what they're interested in doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm a businessman. Yeah. I, I got, I got uh, ledgers I got to keep track of. I curse you with a son that everyone will like more than they like you. Hey, you know. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. so we're going to have a lot of games. I'm going to be bringing uh, a few of my favorites, uh, and there's going to be... They have a, a board game library there that is just outstanding. It's... Um, I mean, it's basically an entire wall is just board games. You can just come check them out, and if you ever see a game that you're like, oh, hey, I've always wanted to try that, I cannot tell you the number of times I've been like, hey, I want to try that game. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that one, and then just, hey, random passers-by, who wants to play this game with me? And then usually people are like, yeah, sure, I'll play a game with you. And you just make some friends, you sit down, you play games. It is so much fun. 
See, I hear you say that, but not to pull the race card, and this kind of goes into our first segment today. I'm a little nervous about doing that. That's fair. For those of you That's guys fair. that haven't met me in person, I am six foot four inches tall. So if I'm somewhere random and I'm like, I'm playing a game, hey, you, come here, sit at this table. Most people are like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, let me grab my purse. You know, so it's a... Uh, it's it's something that you can do that I can't exactly. That's do. fair. That's fair. Yeah. Um, I think that if you could do it anywhere with impunity, Kingdom Con is most likely the place. But still, I can I can understand the hesitation. Yeah. So. Um, oh, sorry, you drop your check from Kingdom Con. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Let me go ahead and just just get all all the sweet Kingdom Con money that I'm shilling for over here. No, I'm I'm yeah. very much a fan. Uh, not a not a paid sponsor. I. This is uh, year 10 of Kingdom Con, and this is the 10th year I've gone to Kingdom Con. Yeah. I've been literally since day one, and I love it. It's Basically, it was set up by a friend of mine who is... He wanted to have a convention that felt like your local game store, where it's all your friends, and you can just show up and play games and just have fun and not not worry about like a super competitive atmosphere, and that's exactly what it is. Every year you go... It's just friends. Everyone there that you've never met is your friend. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the best feeling. I love it. Oh, very cool. Very, yeah. very cool. Um, mm-hmm. As you know, I just got back from WonderCon. That's right. Um, That's that right. Was good, good, good. Good convention. <coughs> one of the best ones I've had so far. And, um, you know, the people there were just amazing. The good. The people there were just amazing. I'm still putting up videos from the stuff that we were there. We hooked up with Nerd Soul, did a collaboration, and um, working on editing the panel of women and representation in literature, comics, and media. So that that was some good stuff. That was yeah, I saw you posted up a clip of uh, you talking with Nerd Soul um, oh, yeah. on the channel. That was, that was good. Yeah. Um, that, that dude seems really, uh, really excited. I would definitely like to you know oh, see more of what he's got to say. The dude is as solid as uranium. I mean, he's just, he's a solid dude. I, yeah, I like him a lot. Um, boy, that was nerdy. Anyway, <laughs> solid so. as uranium is definitely a phrase I haven't heard before, but I, I, I guess he's getting some legs there. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so yeah. Um, but outside of that, it's what have we been doing game wise? Well, um, well, question. Uh, yeah. How is your mic doing? Because I, I got uh, a comment here saying that mine is coming in loud and clear, and yours is not. Hmm. Oh well, that's easy to fix. There we go. Should um should be going in on that one. Fantastic. There, let me double check uh, the sound over here. Yeah, double checking the sound. Um, yeah. No, I'm coming in fine. As All right. As far as that goes. Cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was, fact, I was going to uh, say there's peaking happening. So. Yeah, I was going to say uh you know my my preparations for uh for Kingdom Con next weekend are painting. At a rate, I, I, I am renowned among my friends as a speed painter and able to produce an extremely high quality uh, of, of, of or high quality and high quantity of stuff uh, in a very short amount of time. And even this is ambitious for my standards. I basically have been painting an entire army from scratch to finish in a month. And it, I pretty much am done. Uh, it is daunting, though. It is just, oh my god, it's just so much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's that's it. There. It's mostly done yet. Yeah, excuse the terrible quality photos, but uh, yeah, I was just snapping some quick pictures. Uh, I've actually got a couple of other things that are uh, that are in that army that are already done. But yeah, yeah. That's that's looking at um, basically two thousand points worth of Black Legion for Warhammer Forty K. Uh, and you and your bad guys. I do Black Legion, Cricks. Oh all yeah. That other stuff. And and they're you know, it's just something about that that bad guy aesthetic. They got all the cool stuff. They got all the spikes and skulls and green glowy bits. Yeah, it's good. I like it. Yeah, but um, that actually kind of led me because you sent me the pictures, and it actually led me to think about um, the thing I wanted to talk about today in games. Okay. And there's something that I've noticed mm-hmm. over the course of my life as a gamer. And it's an interesting thing. And um, I was talking with um, um, one of the Deckers out there, good old um, Johnny D&D, who's nice. out there in the chat. And, you know, he and I, as you know, we work with a lot of kids. You know, we mm-hmm. open up the clubs. We do that kind of thing. And as I go into my adventures of setting up these things 
and dealing with the satanic panic of parents that are just like, <laughs> oh my God, they're, they're, yeah, but there be demons and da 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 da. And um, yeah. um, one of the things that I have, one of the things that I've noticed is how easy that panic can happen given gaming culture's um, proclivity for disliking good. Like the gamers themselves tend to dislike yeah, good. Yeah, I can see that. I think that there's there's a lot of that that, you know, because again, the, the origins of a lot of these games happened in the, the 70s and 80s. And, you know, D&D goes back to the 70s. Warhammer goes back to the 80s. And during that time, the the form of counterculture that was very prevalent was much more of the, you know, the more punk rock idea of counterculture as opposed to, you know, something from the 60s. And a lot of that comes with that very aggressive bent to it mm -hmm. and that idea that, you know, you're you're doing the right thing even if you're going against the law and against authority. And the... I think a lot of the aesthetic sensibilities kind of come along with that. So you get that kind of punk rock idea of, okay, well, you're going to be a bad guy. Obviously you need, you know, you need black and spikes and, you know, skulls on your stuff, you know, cause you're fighting against authority, man. And that's how you do it. And so that, that idea that bad is good, I think is, is kind of baked into a lot of the origins for these games and a lot of the sensibilities that kind of went into them. Yeah, there is, there is a bit of that, but see, that's the why Mm -hmm. that the that the aesthetic happens and I'm looking of course you know I'm Mr. Big Picture yeah, comes with yeah. the pointy hat and <laughs> um, um, one of the things that I've definitely noticed just in pop culture in general with um, with the D&D &D thing um, so many people that I've taught the game to over the past year um, have wanted to play tieflings because okay. demons look cool, I guess. I mean, um, they do. And over the course of my gaming life, things like paladins, clerics um, in the superhero world, Superman, Captain America, um, all of the lawful good things that are out there, people tend to shy away from. Yeah. And I wanted to talk today about the nature of good and evil um, in... I guess gaming. you can say in pop culture narration. Um, I was watching, I, I love watching movie reviews, especially at night while I'm going to sleep. And um, last night, there was one that I watched mm -hmm. based on a movie that I saw 25 years ago. Okay. Called Dark Side of the Moon. And two things, two things stuck out to me in this movie. One, the Bermuda Triangle actually links up with a certain part on the moon, and, in, and where they <laughs> link, yeah, I know, right? No, no, no. Where I mean, they link. I is, love, I love terrible movie like yeah. explanations for things. It, yeah, it's, and yeah. Um, well, um, the weirdness of the Bermuda Triangle actually having a counterpoint on the moon and okay. the space between where the two points happen is actually a portal to the underworld. Okay. And I'm right. like, okay, yeah, I, I can work with that. Sure, yeah. Um, but it's one of those space horrors where Satan is, you know, it, it's Satan. It's the devil. I'm the devil. I'm in space. <laughs> sure. And um, the vixen actually um, um, commented on a chat not long ago and... And my little hobbit last night, while I was watching this, reflected that with the, well, if the devil is always in these places, why didn't anybody ever call God? Yeah. I was like, oh, well, you're the devil. You exist. Mirror. Um, well, if the devil exists, God must exist. So why are we fighting? And I think, um, and I think that question has an underlying thing of if the forces of evil are running rampant in their forms. Mm -hmm. like, I'm evil, I'm demon, I'm devil, I'm monster. Blah, blah, blah. Um, why don't the forces of good come down with like angels and trumpets and all that stuff? And the answer is simple from a narrative point of view, which is, okay, well, where's the story? Right. <laughs> um, but the idea that the player characters aren't those forces like um there's a movie 
um, comedy spy movie came out in like 1986 called Real Men. Okay. Starring Jim Belushi and John Ritter. <coughs> All right. And they're on this stupid spy adventure um, to save the world. Generally my favorite kinds of spy movies. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You would really dig this movie. It was okay. really fun. Yeah, I mean, I love um, I love uh, Spies Like Us, you know. That yeah, just like, it was in that vein. Yeah, it exactly. Like vein. two two bumbling um, spies, yeah. Larger scope, smaller scale. Okay. A little weird. Um, and John Ritter plays like a cowardly, um, suburban, um, middle-aged guy who gets hijacked into being a spy to save the world only because he looks exactly like the agent that had the job before. Oh, so okay. So it's like, you look like him, <clears throat> the things that we're dealing with will only deal with him, so you're shanghai Okay, all okay. right. It's a solid premise. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. a solid premise. Um, and there's a moment where when Jim Belushi explains what's happening and what's at stake, he says... Doesn't the government already have guys like that? Uh, doesn't the government have people for that? Yeah. And Jim Belushi looks at him and says, we are those people, Bob. Yeah. You know? And I think that the idea of good, characters being good, characters or players being good, players being powerful, or even just narrative characters being good and powerful and not being deus ex machinas is foreign mm-hmm. to a lot of people. Um, when it looks like the bad guys can run around doing anything willy-nilly. Right. But the good guys have to follow rules, and they can't just wipe things away like they were told um, good is supposed to do. And I think that's where the disillusionment comes in. I think that's where... Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think a lot of it's also, again, kind of baked into the culture. Um, like, I was reading a, a thing the other day. Um, you know, it was a joke comic, but... He's like, well, what's the most American movie ever made? Goes, oh, that's easy. Ghostbusters. Like, what What do you mean Ghostbusters? Yeah, like, what, why is that the most American movie? It's like, look, there is definitive proof these people find that there is not only an afterlife, but that the dead live on and that there's an entire spiritual world out there. And what do they do? They start a small business to cash in on it. This is a movie. <laughs> this is a movie okay. where we have proven we have proven life after death, and there's an entire scene dedicated to salary negotiations. Like they they spend the entire movie fighting government regulations, mm-hmm. uh, in like expanding their workforce and trying to get new clientele. Like again, we're talking about. The forces of good and evil exist. That like we have gods and demons and ghosts and like this entire cosmic thing. And the reason this movie is compelling and also very American is it comes down to the gumption of these handful of individuals to save the day. They don't call on God. They don't call on another being out there to solve their problems for them. They have to do it themselves. And I think it's that that idea of like we have to do it ourselves. That kind of, again, gets baked into the culture of not just the game, but how we play the game, how we perceive it. Well, see, I take a look at that, and I, I, I get where that comes from. And everything that you talk, that you just said, is reason for me to think, all right, this is why being a good guy is awesome. But I think back um, to the game that you and I met over, War Machine. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, because I had to mention with your Warhammer army. And oh yeah, stuff. yeah. But even in War Machine, you were the Cricks. You were yeah. the undead, the <laughs> guys. Oh, yeah, that had to sound great on the on the oh, mic yeah. there. Yeah. And um, I was the church. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I was yeah. the magic slinging religious guys that are seriously like. We deal with a god, and this is our god, and look at our robes, and look at yeah. all of our stuff, and our people are priests. And then my heart broke when I found out that the company itself made my faction the bad guys. The God faction, you mean? Yeah, uh, the Protectorate of Menoff uh, that... in War Machine, from the words of Matt Wilson, are bad. They are lawful evil. And I'm going, hmm. So the only factor that talks, uh, the only faction that has the aesthetic of church where the good guys were all this stuff, and talks about faith and belief and yeah. all of those things have been deemed bad guys by the creator of the game. And I looked at one of my old friends at the time when I was teaching, and he's like, yeah, gamers hate religion. 
I mean, yeah. you're not wrong. And that particular faction, I always liked the way they, they did it because they worship a lawful neutral god, mm -hmm. but the clergy of the faction are lawful evil. And it's that idea that, like, for them, the law matters to the point where they will do anything in the service of it, and that that turns them from lawful neutral into lawful evil. Yeah. But there are there are groups, there are paladins within that faction that are lawful good. Right. And they are not particularly loved by the clergy. Exactly. But they, they are a, a very powerful and potent force within that faction. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Order of the Wall was amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I love playing the paladins. I'm like, these guys are awesome. I want yeah. a unit. And um, the thing was, though, <laughs> there wasn't a faction in War Machine that was as clearly good as there were yeah. Many factions in War Machine and Hordes that were clearly evil. Not until the Circle yeah. of Ouroboros came around. They're not clearly one way or the other no, either. No, they're not. They're natural. Yeah, but that's um, that's kind of the the premise of the entire game is that they're you know no one's hands are clean. Well, and, um, I get that, and I know that we're not. I'm not just talking about War Machine. I'm only using that as an example. Yeah. Of the disdain for good within gaming culture, yes. within geek culture, because um. You know, I've noticed there's been a major push from DC Comics to go Batman, 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 Batman. He's dark, he's cool, he's dark, he's cool, he's dark. And the Marvel movies um, kind of did a push in the opposite direction with Captain America mm -hmm. going, no, he's a good person who does the good things for the good reasons, and he's cool. Yeah. And that's what Superman used to be. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if it was the 90s or the early 2000s or 9-11 that posted this bit of cynicism in um, nerd culture, geek culture, um, that says being good is lame. Or if it's adolescent um, rebellion because your whole life you're told be good, be good, be good, be good. But from what I've noticed just sociologically, being good is a very narrow thing with very, very, very unclear um, criteria. And any deviation from that makes one evil. Yeah. So if it's, well, if I'm going to go, like, I, I think about this, you know, it's Sunday, I've been talking, I, I've been working for a pastor, um, and I've been thinking, like, okay, well, that whole good, evil thing, but good is a very, very, very slim margin, and especially evangelicals have this idea that if it isn't in that slim margin the rest of everything belongs to the devil <laughs> and i'm kind of going all right yeah. so is this pushback against that idea with the damned if i do damned if i don't i'm just going to watch tv i think there's or... a lot of that for sure um and i think that you're you're definitely on the right idea that there's a lot of pushback um mm -hmm. and Gamers in general, um, especially a lot of the ones who have founded the companies that are making these games and therefore dictating in mm -hmm. the game who is right and who is wrong, have traditionally been part, or at least have felt part, of marginalized groups because of what they love. Um, you know, again, the, kind of the entire premise of what we're doing here is to destigmatize a lot of that. Right. But, you know, a lot of these people are in their 40s and 50s, and they grew up, you know, 30 years ago, 40 mm -hmm. years ago, where the things that they loved when they wanted to get into fantasy, they wanted to get into, you know, it was very stigmatized, and they lived through a lot of the, the satanic panic where even liking something that had wizards in it means you're obviously, you know, again, that the church influence. Evil. Yeah. You're part of Satan's army. Exactly. And yes, you have the better company and the cooler music. You are still evil. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's when you grow up where it's like, well, I don't feel like I'm a bad person. I feel like I'm doing good things. But if I'm not doing, if I'm not towing the line, the arbitrary line that this church has set up, I'm, I'm bad. I'm evil. I'm part of Satan's army. But I'm clearly, you know, in my mind, not. I'm doing the right thing. So I feel like that, that mentality where, again, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, but taken to the, you know, to the, the petty levels that the satanic panic did in the 80s especially, where just liking anything that was <laughs> not... That was not going to church every day, you know, clearly with Satan. I mean, I, I grew up with this um, as a very prevalent part of my upbringing. And that idea that, like, okay, well, no matter what I do, no matter what TV shows I watch, no matter what games I play or books I read, it's probably all going to be the devil anyway. So 
who cares? Maybe I'll just do the things that are fun and I'll work it out um, at the end. Okay. And I think that's, that's that's been the formative experience of a lot of the people that make these games. And a lot of gamers today have kind of grown up with that and the legacy of that, where it's not that good is dumb. It's not that good <laughs> is, you know, like there's, there's the, the quote yeah, from Spaceballs, the, you know, like... That is why evil will always oh, win. Because good is dumb. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, and yeah. it, it, like no villain actually thinks that, which is why the line is funny. Each villain thinks they're doing good, but the arbitrary line set by someone else is like, well, no, you're actually evil and we have to stop you. But the villain probably has very good reasons for doing what they do, and I think that that's, for a lot of people, a more compelling angle for them to explore. They want to see the people who are not crusading for good, but still end up doing the right thing or doing the good thing. You know, they're not out there murdering babies, but they're also not out there, you know, kissing babies. <laughs> you know, like they're they're trying to walk the more normal person line. And even if that gets them called evil by a, a position of authority, it's also more realistic for the people playing them. Well, I, I totally understand that whole idea. I know when I run my games, I like running campaigns with good guys. Yeah. Because, you know, superhero fetish, and at the end of the day, regardless of what of how bitter people think I am, I, I really am a big teddy bear. Um, but you know how I am on nuance. Yeah. I'm, I'm there, there's, um, when I talk about any, 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 any particular... Um, any particular, what's the term I'm looking for, um, area. Like, you know, there is, you know, there's a really, 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 really far difference between, say, um, a racist store owner that doesn't have the thing that's laying on the wall. Right. And burning crosses, you know? Yeah. Um, and when it comes to evil and good... There are steps. There are nuances. It's not just Captain America versus um, Doctor Doom. Right. Or Captain America versus Mephisto. But one thing I have most definitely noticed with gamers and geeks of most cultures, or <clears throat> geek culture within at least Southern California, is just the idea of a Hufflepuff. Um, a Superman, a Captain America. I bring up Hufflepuff guys because yeah, I read the Harry Potter books and I like them. But their house model, their house motto is "Do good because." Yeah, that's it. Do good because. Yep. Now, granted, I took the test. I'm a Ravenclaw, so <laughs> "Wit beyond measure" is our greatest treasure. But do good <coughs> because. <coughs> do good because that's what you do. Do good right. because it's good for everybody. And, of course, morally looking at things and logistically looking at things, if you apply the principles of good, lawful good, neutral yeah. good, even chaotic good, just to use the D&D um, terms, um, across the board, for everyone in a society, you come out with a better society than any Absolutely. other combination in any other um, and that's also why when you're talking about Dungeons and Dragons, the alignment system carries over to the the way they frame their entire civilization and why mm -hmm. you have, you know, which I take issue with because they frame it like, you know, the civilized races are generally good and therefore they have civilizations that are, you know, doing well. But then like the, you know, the uncivilized orcs and goblins and all that. Oh, they're evil, and that's why they well, don't have... That's a different subject. Um, I, I know. Different, that's, that's, more, that's more socialist stuff, but um, even in the D&D books, it's the lawful versus chaotic that makes the... Because there is lawful evil. Like, um, um, demons yeah. are lawful evil, and they have a perfectly functioning society. Mm, Granted, they fair. have slaves, they have... You know, all that other stuff, but chaotic, you know, given that the lawful alignment is selfless, um, like when it comes to the good evil, okay, um, chaotic is the chaotic neutral lawful scale in that part is more selfless to selfish. Okay. So um, there is, like, when it comes to lawful evil, you're dedicated to a code. Yeah. You, there is the laws that the evil do, and 
they will do whatever it takes to uphold the law in up to and including curb stomping infants yeah and you know um taking slaves and setting things on fire kind of like the legion in fallout new vegas yeah you know they are yeah. they are lawful evil yeah but absolutely. they function yeah very functioning but they society function. yeah. um so well, when it comes to like the lawful good characters the paladins the clerics um, just the lawful good fighters, the Superman type characters, yeah. the Captain America type characters. People, one thing I've noticed is people don't like playing them because they can't imagine lawful good people having cool personalities. You know? Yeah, that that is typically the um, the stereotype that gets thrown around. You know, like the why people don't like playing paladins for one thing or by extension why they don't why they claim they don't like reading superman comics it's mm -hmm. like oh it's just a goody two-shoes boy scout you know i don't want to just read that story over and over again which i you know again i fundamentally disagree with but it's absolutely the idea that goes coming goes from along someone that. that doesn't read superman comics funny i mean i've read <laughs> an amount of superman comics and i enjoy superman I'm just giving you crap i know you're, so. you're giving me crap but i do enjoy superman as a character and i didn't used to but you know again i've come around because i i had you know as the phrase goes drunk the kool-aid as far as oh just a goody two-shoes boy scout what is there in that story and i started seeing good stories i was like oh <laughs> there's actually a lot in that story that i can get involved in and by the same token um a paladin, by being lawful and good, can still have an incredible amount of character depth. He can have a lot of growth. He can have a lot of, right. you know, th there can be a lot to this character that doesn't have to be, oh, well, he's just a morally neutral mercenary who is rah, 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 which a lot of people enjoy playing in D&D. &D. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you can still get a lot of fun and compelling character stuff whether it's, you know, consuming it as a media in the form of television or comics or, you mm -hmm. know, whatever else, or playing it as a character in games, you can absolutely get a compelling story out of someone who is lawful and good and trying to do the right thing. You know, I, I, I enjoy the, uh, the trope of someone trying to do the right thing, but, man, he just has a bad time of things, like, <laughs> all the time, no matter what he does. Like, he's like, I gotta Look, get you some Spider-Man comics. <laughs> Spider-Man Spider <laughs> is my favorite superhero. Yeah. So, yeah, um, and that's, that, that's, that's part of his why. life. Exactly. That's, you know? that's exactly why. It's like, look, you're trying to do the right thing, but man, you're just <laughs> getting kicked in the junk repeatedly. <laughs> and you do, you know, and, and I identify very strongly with this in my mm. personal life. Just keep getting kicked in the junk. You just keep getting back up, and because that's what you do. I'm sorry, you shocked me when you came in. Okay, I, I didn't know that you'd come through the door, and you, you know. know this. This is the life I lead. <laughs> you know, I walk in, get kicked in the junk, roll around the floor for a while, get back up, do a show with you. Yeah, yeah it's just that's how it works. And the only reason I kicked you while you were on the ground was because I didn't know a better time. Yeah, um, no, that, that is the best time. I mean, I can't kick back. So yeah, yeah. but no, um, and I, I'm I'm definitely there. But that takes us into our next segment. All right. Which is um, belief versus conflict, and this is this is kind of a literary thing and a way that people can look at characters, whether they're writing them or playing them or mm -hmm. playing NPCs. This is all the way across the board. Um, I hear, and you you said it a little earlier. Um, you know that belief that quote I'm a good person now. For the sake of our viewers, I'm not going to rant. But what I will say is this. Um, good people do bad things all the time. That sure. doesn't make them bad people. How they handle the bad things that they do, accidentally most of the time, has a huge, huge impact on whether or not they stay good people. Yeah. And um, when it comes to that, this is a matter of beliefs versus Actions. Now, this is something that's really relevant to the world today. Yeah. Because um, a lot of people are like, you know, nobody believes they're a bad person. Nobody believes they're a bad person. Um, one of my favorite shows on television right now is BoJack Horseman. Oh, my God. This I, show's so yeah, good. I yeah, love BoJack. It deals but, with that that as a central theme. Yeah. You know, like anybody watching that show can be like, man, BoJack's kind of a piece of crap. Yeah, he's terrible. He's terrible. He's terrible. And he wants to hold on to this idea that he's good while a 
he does major bad things. Yep. B, he takes no responsibility for the yep. bad things that he does. Um, C, he does nothing to fix the effects from the bad things that yep. he did. And D, he holds people accountable for holding him accountable to the bad things that mm -hmm. he did. Like, this is a bad dude. <laughs> yeah. Okay? He is a bad, bad, bad um, person. Great character. Oh, yeah. Bad Very person. Very compelling character. Yeah. And a, a lot of that is because he is so convinced that he is not bad when there's so much evidence to the contrary that you can just hold up directly in his face and he'll just explain it away in some other sense. Right. And, God, it just... And it, see, this is where vivid characters come from. Yeah. The whole idea, the Kool-Aid that you drank, and I even drank it for a while because I thought, well, I was bitter. I was yeah. very bitter. I was very angry. And I was mad at the Superman character. I'm like, great, he gets sent across the universe. Yeah, oh no, he lost his whole species. And? And yeah. he landed on a planet that turned him into a god, and he just happened to have been found by the best parents in literary mm -hmm. history. And, you know, all the stuff that normal people go through with life was just kind of handed to him. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there was... There is no Superman going to college to study journalism before right. he became an investigative journalist, you know. Um, he didn't do that. He pretty much graduated high school, walked into Metropolis, showed he could type really fast, and became a became, um, thing. And you can be an investigative reporter if you're invulnerable. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's so no, it's there's like, not a lot of trouble you can get in when you're investigating dangerous situations when you can just walk away from literally anything. Right. And, yeah. But the big thing was... Um, I was comparing it to my life, which was difficult at the time, and the stories from the 50s and 60s, where they weren't stories, they were really quick adventures, you know, wham bam, thank you ma'am, let's just give the troops something to inspire them so that they can keep fighting in the war, yeah. let's give the kids something entertaining to shut them up while daddy goes into the study and has a bourbon, you know, and... Um, what, I'm yeah. not wrong. No, 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 you're, you're not wrong. It's just, it's, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and around the 70s, when comics in general became more, like, they were always serial, but when the stories became deeper, when the writers of comic books started writing stories, I guess yeah. you can say at the birth of the graphic novel, um, the stories had to go up a notch. You know, we had more savvy, more savvy, um, more savvy... Readers, readers, yeah. You know, and um, now I think about the characters because, again, um, even in comic books, we just got done with Captain America's Secret Empire, where it turns out reality was shifted. He was a Hydra agent the whole time, and Captain America went bad. Yeah. And Injustice, where Superman goes bad and takes over the world and does the totalitarian regime. And I'm like, okay, what I get a sense of right now is that people have a hard time believing that a good can triumph yeah b good is worth having and i get that i totally get that i was in high school once too you know yeah and i, I bring up high school because it's a really 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 informative time to people yeah in high school the mean girls are the most popular the jerky guys get most of the attention from all the girls not yeah. just the popular ones but the unpopular ones who don't know the difference between confidence and arrogance yet yeah um so the bad people are the ones that are the most popular and then we take a look at the superman characters the captain marvel characters the most disrespected good guy in all of comic books cyclops yeah. <laughs> the dude that the yeah. dude that's a true believer that follows the rules he is a good leader and he's a decent guy and he's not that boring to hang out with just in the context of the x-men he's kind of the boss yeah. <laughs> you know well and also you know putting it all in context mm -hmm. the the world that we live in now is not a world where good is triumphing no you know this is i mean objectively speaking whatever your politics are Good people are not in charge. Mm -hmm. Good things are not happening. Like the the matter world... of fact, the best things are happening to the worst people, yeah. or to the people that behave the wor in, in the most self centered and poor ways. Yeah, and they're happening to the people 
who have no wish, no real wish to help those who the good things aren't happening to. And, and, and going, going back to the idea that the villains don't see themselves as the villains, in the real world, the people that we might consider villains, the ones who are, are benefiting from the society that we consider to be bad, are the ones who are doing it for personal enrichment. You know, they're, they're helping them and theirs. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're working to make the, better, the world better for their people. <laughs> I'm just making the world a better place for you. Exactly. You're making the world a better place for you. And you know. that idea that, you know, we look around, we go, okay, well, apparently that's what succeeds. Mm-hmm. Apparently being a jerk, being evil by our standards, by pretty much any alignment chart that we would identify with in a game, that's what succeeds. That's what puts you at the top. That's where you get the money, the power, you know, the women, the whatever, you, whatever metric you're using to mm-hmm. determine you're doing well for yourself. That's that's you know, and what uh what do the good guys got going for them? The good guys lose elections. <laughs> the good guys are poor. Yeah. The good guys. The good are, guys go broke. The good guys they, go broke. You know. The good guys get shot by cops. They get you know they're they're in protests that don't seem to have any changes that yeah, are affected. Their businesses get get either swallowed up by the businesses of the bad guys yep. or just plain put out of business. I.e. grocery stores in Walmart. Yep. Or Barnes and Nobles and Amazon. Yep. You know, or not Barnes and Nobles because there's still one or two, but like Borders and Amazon. Yeah. You know, and then you end up in a world where you have to choose between the terrible business practices of Walmart versus the terrible business practices of Target because there right. is nowhere else. And that's you know? and, and when you find yourself in the real world looking at that, your perception of what your fantasy world is gonna be is gonna obviously be colored by that. You sure. know, your idea of like, ah, oh, I wanna be a paladin fighting for good. I don't know, man. How does fighting for good work out in your experience? When you look around, it kind of looks like fighting for good is going to end up with you just losing and not having a lot of fun. Why, If you're doing an <laughs> escapist thing where you're trying to have some fun first and foremost, it's hard to get in the mindset of, oh, this is going to be a fun thing when you don't see good having any fun. I, I definitely, you know, I, I can definitely see that. And this is where I want to offer hope. Excuse me. And I know, I know, it's really hard to transmit what you haven't got, but follow it, okay? <laughs> um, because um, here's the thing. Now, everything that you just described is playing a lawful good character in Ravenloft. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that, because Ravenloft, oh, run God, by, a death, Ravenloft. <laughs> you know, run by a death knight and a freaking vampire. Yeah. And anybody that's good pings out so everyone can swarm them and, yeah. you know, eat their tasty, 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 shiny, blessed armor. Um but the hope, like the hope with the escapism is that good can triumph, like harne- har- not, not harnessing, but focusing and nurturing those beliefs, okay, within games, within narratives. This is why it's so important, because in order for good to triumph, in order for your side to triumph, regardless of what you consider good is, you must believe in the possibility of that triumph you know you have to believe like most people don't believe that they're the bad guys but the bad guys believe that they're the good guys absolutely and that belief is what rockets them forward you know the amazon dude jeff whatever his name is um he believed deep down in places that he don't talk about at parties (laughs) that he could get to where he was yeah. Uh, to where he is. Bill Gates believed that it was the right thing to steal that operating system from Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve Jobs believed it was the right thing to take over yet another company. Yeah. And he believed that the CD was a crap piece of technology. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, the idea that being a ruthless businessman and still believing that you are doing a good thing those are those are ideas that can be held in superposition very easily in our society and to an outside observer you might go man ruthless is probably not something that i would ever associate with a good person but at the same time it's absolutely something you you can associate with a successful person ah. and in our you know we joked about ghostbusters earlier but that that idea that like succeeding at a thing is good inherently 
that you know our society prizes that to the point where we are raised with success is good Mm -hmm. success at any cost is good good you know be good because don't that don't work here (laughs) american society does not prize that we don't prize be good because we prize be good as long as it's successful and be successful because it will be good well that's Kind of the cost of capitalism. Oh yeah, I mean that—that's really where that comes down. It literally. I mean, you know, my 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 politics know. will absolutely have me ranting about capitalism as cancer here very quickly. But yeah, so we're not going <laughs> to go too all far the way into there, that. except yeah. in the sense that capitalism, at its base, rewards capitalism and calls one with the most capital the most successful. Right. So following that whole chain of logic, <laughs> um, success equals good. Capital equals success, therefore, via the laws of transitive properties, yep. um, capital is e- good. Yep. And that's where we find ourselves now. Um, but looking past that, and I'm not going to offer any other um, political ideology, yeah. but I look to kids. Okay? I look to kids. Um, one three-year-old <coughs> looking at another three-year-old who's hurt and crying wants to help yeah that in and of itself is the definition of human nature because i'm talking not any okay i don't want yeah i I hate having come i hate having arguments with people that use um um outlying um outlying data um yeah the bell curve shows that the majority the vast majority of three-year-olds who see someone hurting you know just this morning I spilled hot coffee on my hand, and my daughter immediately stopped what she was doing. Daddy, you okay? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Daddy has said a few choice words, and I will be okay. Let's take a break. I need to. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And your kid is too. Yeah. Your kid is too. Your kid is in the middle of the nose, but it still stops what it's doing to spontaneously yeah. help you. and yeah. Or at least to check on me to make sure that if I'm hurting, everything's okay. Yeah, and yeah. see, that's that's the thing. And this is where, within our games, within the stuff that we do in our games, um, the underlying thing is, will they do that? But, much like the difference between archetypes and stereotypes, and that's what we're going to get in on the literary part of mm-hmm. today's, um, it's a jumping-off point. It's not an end point. And this yeah. is where the difference lies um, when it comes to um, characters in stories or player characters that get stuck between what they do equals what they are. Okay? Um, yeah. Just because a person would look at an emergency situation, stop what they're doing and help, that doesn't make them good. That's the first step on the staircase. Yeah. <laughs> and when it comes, and again, this is all in response to the no one believes they're a bad person, everyone believes they're a good person. Most people believe they're a good person. Because they would do that. If you push a baby into traffic, they will at least, well, they think that they would at least try and go get the baby. Right. Most people would stop and film it, but welcome to the 21st century. (laughs) Um, You know. issue there. Yeah. yeah. But but that's basic. That's like reading The Dark Knight Returns. That's 101. Yeah. That's Pavlov's dog for a psych major. Well, you know, well, looping back around uh, to Superman for just a second, mm-hmm. the story that actually got me to to take a second look at Superman and, mm-hmm. and start to take that character more seriously was Superman Red Sun. Okay. Which, the, the basic premise, and I, I just, I love the way they do it, because the basic premise is exactly the same. Superman comes here from Krypton, D, all the above. But instead of landing in rural Kansas, lands in Siberia. In, yep. <laughs> and it's the same concept of, like, you know decent folk pick him up, you know, people with good internal moral compasses pick him up um, and raise him as best they can, the difference being that he's raised in a, you know, in Soviet Russia in the 1940s and 50s as opposed to in America. So instead of truth, justice, the American way, it's all about the Soviet ideology. Mm -hmm. And so you take Superman divorced from the politics of America and look, you, you get to see what 
of the goodness of his essential nature survives in that in that circumstance. And the answer is all of it. He's, he's <laughs> yeah. still at his core. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's at his core essentially a good person. The the trappings of the politics and how that manifests are different because of the circumstances he finds himself in. But the inherent goodness of the character shines through. He is still someone who wants to help other people. And the way he does it again is different because of the circumstances. But he's trying to help or people. More to the point, the culture. Yes. The culture that he's in. Yeah. Um. The culture he's in is different. And the ways he tries to help people are different. But, you know, and, and the framing of things are different. You know, in this case, Lex Luthor, still being an American, <laughs> is, you know, the framing of this is now not the villain Lex Luthor trying to stop the hero Superman. Nope. It is Lex Luthor, the hero of America, fighting against the evil Soviet alien menace. Mm -hmm. And that framing device still has Superman not going out to destroy America. He's not trying to kill Lex Luthor and wipe out America. He's like, no, no, we're going to try to be the best we can be here. I'm going to put all of the good I can into internal growth here and not being a villain and taking over the world and killing Lex Luthor and killing the... No, that's not who he is. And despite there is pressure in this comic from the people in authority mm -hmm. to do exactly that, he's like, no, that's not who I am. That's not what we are. We're going to do the best we can and be good people here and don't worry about Lex Luthor and his army of super mutants yeah. that he's raising he's over like, there to fight I me. I got those. Now yeah. let's feed our people. Exactly. You know? And um, and yeah, that was... I also recommend um, Superman Shazam First Thunder. I think you would love it. I'll check it out. And it, and it shows us... It ends abruptly. I want I want to let you know. It ends abruptly. But um, it, it's... One, you get to see Shazam at the time. It's pre-New it's pre -new 52, so it's still Captain Marvel. But it's Shazam and Superman fighting side by side. That's pretty cool. They yeah. fight monsters, and it's awesome. Um, but now we get into um, one of your favorite segments and kind of one of my favorite segments. Um, you know, the writing part. This yes. is how to create stories and stuff. Yeah, and I was, I was going to say, I don't know if this is a, a today's subject, but related to what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the writing goes, most of the games that I've run have been, um, I'm going to go ahead and say morally ambiguous games. Mm -hmm. And um, not out of... You know, any, any of this is how I must do it. It's just how it always ends up being. You know, a, a group of more mercenary folks that fall more in line with neutral or chaotic good than they do with, you know, heroes trying to save the world. And I don't have a particular problem with that, but I've never run a game that's explicitly you guys are the heroes, the good guys, and you're here to save the world. So I'd be interested to find out you know, some of the pros and cons of that from your perspective and whether or not that should be something that is kind of railroaded onto the players or supposed to develop naturally. Mm. That is for a different day. Okay. We'll probably, we'll probably cover that the Sunday after Kingdom Con. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that's Easter. I think we're not doing a show that day. Mm. Oh, well, you're not doing a show that day. Well, I mean, yeah. No, no, okay. Fine. I've got Charlie. But yeah, so looks like you'll be yeah. watching the show. I will be watching day. the show. Yeah. Um, who when, knows? Maybe. When do we next meet? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I may even have you um, do the Skype in on that. That's one, possible. You've got, you've got the kid, but I also know you have a webcam. So, That's true. Um, but now today's thing, we're going to talk about something that I've been, I've, I, I was inspired to think about um, because of discussions with people, because of other videos I watch. And I want to discuss the difference between archetype and stereotype, okay. especially, especially since um, <clears throat> I deal so much in comic books, and yeah. right now Marvel and DC both have a movie in the theaters. Yeah, and ironically, at one point they were both they both had the same name, so it's interesting. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I deal with um, is a lot of people dislike DC because DC are aspirational heroes. Right. Okay, they're they're heroes that you're not going to meet on your day-to-day -day life. You're not supposed to relate to them. You're supposed to aspire to be like them. They're more of mythological characters where Marvel are cathartic um, motivational heroes. These are the people that we know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but DC dealing with those aspirational heroes means that they deal a lot with archetypes. Mm -hmm. Now, first off, again, I talk to a lot of people from all walks of life. I've been talking right. a lot with Trump supporters um, and a lot with very, very evangelical, conservative 
right wing people. Um, and one of them said something that I've been hearing for years. All right. Which is stereotypes exist for a reason. Yeah, I've heard that one a lot too. Yeah. Now, yeah. did I break my coffee mug across their teeth? No, I didn't. One, because that would do nothing but feed into the stereotype of angry black man. Sure. And two, it doesn't actually instruct or open up the mind. Okay? And that's what I'm here to do. I'm trying to get everybody yeah. just looking at at least the facts regardless of what they think. Yeah. Just, yeah. this is what is. Stop, stop painting over it and all that stuff. Um, so when you're dealing in stories, okay, um, this is big with NPCs. Um, with tertiary characters, okay? Archetypes versus stereotypes. Now, the biggest common example of archetypes that we would have in modern, like 2000, uh, past 2010, almost 2020, <coughs> example is the Justice League. Okay. Okay, the Justice League are reflections of the greek gods from apollo to hades you know yeah. superman apollo batman hades flash mercury you know all sure. that stuff um but but there's another aspect there they're all archetypes superman is the lawful good guy wonder yeah. woman is the warrior aquaman is the guy in the water um <laughs> batman is the guy in the shadows he's the dark brooding one you know and this is actually a reflection to the last place my generation learned archetypes being the breakfast club okay because deep down each one of us is a brain an athlete a princess a yeah. basket case and a criminal <laughs> and um and you can go deep in a lot of these things but when you take a look at archetypes archetypes are <clears throat> again we just talked a whole lot about the boy scout and the god that won't let you down superman yeah. Um. And you know, I it warmed my heart to see you that passionate over a Superman story because I'm getting you into comics. Yeah. Um. But a stereotype, a stereotype. One, a lot of people equate stereotype with negativity. Right. Okay. Um. And positive stereotypes are fine, right? I mean, you know, one of the biggest positive stereotypes that I've seen. Um, that does rub the people at stereotyping the wrong way mm -hmm. is Asians are good at math. Yeah. You're Asian, you're good at math. Or Asian knows martial arts. Now, that's a cultural stereotype that does not apply to American raised Asians. <laughs> yeah. You know? And there's um, uh, an episode of Adam Ruins Everything where he, he addresses exactly why that's so bad. Mm -hmm. Like, because again, it's like, oh, it's a good thing, right? You're. You know, your stereotypes, you're good at math. It's like, well, at best, that puts unfair pressure on someone who isn't and puts them in a bad position. But also, you're locking someone in a little box that you're not going to let them out of because, oh, no, this is the thing you do. This is the thing you're good at. And don't try to be anything else. Mm -hmm. and that's not okay either, you know. Now, one of the major places that we find stereotypes, especially in middle class America, is the Zodiac. Oh, God, yeah. You know, yeah, I know. I say that, and you're like, ugh. Yeah, but how no, many people do you know that goes, well, they're a Gemini, so they're going to be indecisive. Right. Um, they're, in my case, a Taurus, so you're going to be stubborn. <laughs> you know, and again, these are all just different ways that we stereotype. Um, and mm -hmm. when it comes to narrative stuff, okay, and this is important because what a stereotype is is a lazy shortcut for archetyping. Yes. And here is the difference. Superman is a Boy Scout. Okay? Okay. All right. Loyal, confident, all those other things. Yeah. That does not mean he does not suffer. That does not mean he right. does not doubt. It means through all the tribulations, he is going to do everything in his power to do what's best for the most amount of people. Yeah. Okay. That is the archetype of the Boy Scout. Um, Batman is going to be the dark guy in the shadows. Yeah. So he is going to be secretive. He is going to loom. He's going to threaten. But at the end of the day, he's going to do the best he can within his powers to do the most good for the most people. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, now, the difference between an archetype and a stereotype is this. An archetype is this is the foundation from which we build on a character or we build on a bunch of stuff. So Superman is a Boy Scout. So a Boy Scout in this situation, this is what they could learn. This is how they can evolve. Though they are a Boy Scout, a Boy Scout is a lot more than we think it is. So let's evolve around the Boy Scout path. Let's evolve down the wizard path for Dr. Yeah. Fate. Let's evolve down the outsider path for the Martian Manhunter. You know, let's evolve down the Amazon path for Wonder Woman. Like, Amazons fight, you know, they're women that fight, but what else? Yeah. Okay? Um, where stereotypes tend to be where people stop thinking. Yeah. That, that is, makes sense. You know, this is where, you know, again, I fight the stereotype of angry black man. Yeah. From time to time, I am angry. I do identify as a cis head man. <laughs> and I am not from the Caucasus Mountains. It's true. So when I am angry, for whatever reason, be it righteous or unreasonable, you know, when I'm righteously angry, I'm still angry black man. And yeah. that's where people who use stereotypes stop thinking. Now, in your lump writing, you into that category, and then look. Well, now I don't have to treat you as a person because you're just a category now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And when you're working on your narratives, okay, um, this is for again. This section is for writers and GMs and people that are interested in fiction. Um, when you're coming up with your characters, it's fine to start from an archetype, but you yeah. have to build more from that archetype. You have to make that archetype three-dimensional because there is a huge difference, huge difference between, say, Kevin Hart in any of the movies that he did with The Rock <laughs> and those two Transformers from the Michael Bay movie. We all know which ones they're oh talking boy. about. Yeah. You know, both of them are based on the, on the archetype of urban black dude. Yeah. But Kevin Hart evolved. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, the movie that he did with The Rock, where The Rock is the dude that actually idolized Kevin Hart as a kid. And yeah, so he actually starts from urban black dude. He goes to suburban man. He's in a midlife crisis. He's going through all this other stuff because he is a three dimensional human character. Yeah. Versus those two robots from Transformers that are doing nothing but talking jive in a way that a white writer would write it. Yeah. You know. And that's I think that's that's a lot of the problem right there is you have a writer who doesn't understand the culture they're writing about and so all they have to work with are stereotypes. Um so when they want to add, oh I don't know, some I'm gonna go ahead and put this in really harsh air quotes ethnic sorts of characters because it can be anyone but then they're like okay well, what do i know about what this do you mean group? you're here for hour you go now yeah that, <sighs> that stuff it's like well they don't know anything about the culture of the characters so they go oh what do i know oh they they talk kind of like this and uh there's this one uh korean lady in a laundromat who said that to me once so i'll just go ahead and i'll base everything on that and truth be told I was okay with that as an excuse in the 80s. Okay. Because it was easy to stay in your bubble in the 80s. Now we got the internet. That thing that we're on right now. Yeah. So anybody, any, and again, this is for all you writers out there. There is no excuse. None. Okay. You can go on YouTube and learn about different cultures. Yeah. You can go on Reddit and say, I am writing a short story. I'm thinking about adding a character from um, from this culture, I would like to talk to someone about why someone from Korea would open up a store and how commerce works in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, exactly. You've got the information at your fingertips now. So there is no reason to stereotype NPCs outside of laziness. Um, now, I'm no, not no, saying... Uh, well, yep. no, I guess, yeah, laziness is the, the ultimate reason because um, it's a lot of work to be able to um, to make compelling characters that have a cultural identity that is different from yours and also are fully realized as people, and, you know, like all that sort of stuff. If 
it's a lot of front-loaded work for you to learn all of that. <laughs> and that's not to say you shouldn't do it, but that's why people don't. Right. You know, it, it's it's really difficult. And if you put someone up to, hey, look, man, if you want to make this character an actual compelling character, you have to put in a lot of work to make this happen. They go, you know what? Or I could just have them be a secondary or tertiary character, talk and jive, and then uh, that's fine, right? We'll just, we'll well, just go Only if you want to get slapped by me the next time we see it. That's well, that's, that's my say. point, though, is, yeah. <laughs> is people will just, they assume that, oh, yeah, this character's not in this story enough to be a real person, so I can just use a stereotype and be lazy. Right. And that's exactly why they do it. I'm not saying that that's good. But to avoid that is a lot of work, even for secondary and tertiary characters, which, especially when you're writing something like an RPG, Mm -hmm. you may not have the ability to do that amount of front-loaded research. And so, in a pinch, a GM is likely to fall back on a stereotype. And the truth is, this is where I'm saying it's time for GMs to be better. It's real simple. If If you only have a stereotype to fall back on either a positive one or a negative one, drop the character. Just drop it. Put in something that you know. Okay, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra, back in the 50s, wrote a song called I Could Write a Book, and it was based on the idea that I know this so well, I can write a book about it. I say often that you can't transmit what you haven't got. Yeah. So if you're going to put these things in a narrative, you have to have it to put it. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, if you don't have it and you're married to the idea of putting it in, then get it. Get it. Do the research. Um, every novel has a Bible. Okay. If you're super good, like Tolkien, then you can publish the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what the Silmarillion was, guys. It was just, it was the Bible to the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And what I mean, a Bible is a full fledged history character write-ups, cultural write-ups, geographic write-ups. Now, I'm not saying you got to be Tolkien and write 30,000 pages. No one probably ever will be again. I mean... Martin's well on his way, in my opinion. i got to say that. Um, uh, Yeah. I I don't know. I see, see, like, Martin approaching Tolkien. He's not going to meet or eclipse him, I don't think. on, On the way is exactly that. I'm not saying he's there. Yeah. I'm saying he's on the way. Um, King is kind of that for horror. Yeah. You know, as was Lovecraft, but not quite because other people built the mythos after Lovecraft. Yeah, and Lovecraft is but, operating just on a different sort of story. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, that's... I, I Oftentimes I use Lovecraft to justify the racists that I know because I think they're just trying to go transcendent like he did. You know, <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, yeah. I do a racist AF. Uh, <laughs> like, For the time. <laughs> I, yeah, even, yeah, even in the context of the time he was in, like, oh, I do pretty racist, yeah, actually. Dorothy like, Parker was like, yeah, uh, yeah, I gotta be where you're not. Yeah. Um, but outside so. of outside of that, um, when you're coming up with your characters, again, a stereotype is lazy writing. It's lazy writing. It's lazy thinking. It makes to lazy storytelling and lazy behavior. Where understanding archetypes, okay, and there's loads of stuff out there from Jung to Freud to hundreds of screenwriters. And, you know, there are thousands of hours of this stuff on the internet where you can just, thousands of hours on YouTube where you can like look at archetypes. Okay, but most mythology is based on archetypes. Most of the gods, you know, in Greek, Norse, um, Irish, uh, Irish, Native American, just whatever. Mm-hmm. Most of those god characters are archetypical. Yeah. Um, and opposed to stereotypical. Because stereotypes were created by ignorant people who didn't understand. So, so I, I have a question for you then. Because yes. um, what you're saying could be interpreted as don't GM a game unless you've done a zillion hours of front-loaded research. And I know that's not what you're saying, but if someone were to be interpreting it like that, how would you try to clarify that? Well, thank you for giving me the question involving major, major mental gymnastics. (laughs) I'm not saying to not GM a game unless you've done all the hours of research. What I'm saying is if all you have to work on are archetypes, then don't GM a stereotypes, then don't GM a game. Second half to that, you have more 
than archetypes because you know people. Yeah. <laughs> you know people. You went to school. You got friends. Um, you got enemies. You got family members. You know, what I'm saying is, um, I don't want to say as far as stay in your lane, but I'm saying don't switch lanes until you've checked to see if there's another car there. You know, um, when you're writing your NPCs and you're writing your characters, if you're writing your character so that you can accentuate an archetype, then you're being insulting. Not offensive, insulting. Just like if my only character for a white person when I'm doing impressions is, that guy is over there, <laughs> that's right, uh -huh. I'm my own grandpa and I love my sister wife. If that's the only, only idea I had about Southerners, poor yeah. Southerners, trailer park people then yeah i'd be being lazy yeah but you know just on my facebook the other day i i put something uh, i put a quote out there straight from the south you know straight from the south i'm talking the rural south which is say what you mean mean what you say just don't say it mean and i'm like that's right you know yeah plat that and you don't get more country than that yeah <laughs> you know um you know country don't mean dumb it yeah. don't mean inbred. It just means this is my accent and this is where I grew up. Just like ghetto yeah. does not mean barbaric and dangerous. <laughs> just like white doesn't mean refined. Yeah. Nor does it mean ignorant. You know, there are nuances in every single culture that you can come up with and that you've come across. You know the nuances in, in the culture that you're in. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to expose those in a narrative, be it a game or um, <clears throat> or a short story or a novel, then focus on what you have. And if you want to add something that you don't have, go get it. That's all. So I'm not saying don't GM a game unless you're willing to put in thousands of hours of work. You already have. It's called your life <laughs> and your pop culture. Okay. okay. You've already done that. Draw from there. But... Don't rely on on stereotypes um, because you don't want to read a whole lot more. You, you, you see what I mean? No, absolutely. Yeah, and and you know the idea you, you hear it all the time. Like number one writing advice: uh, write what you know. And <laughs> yeah, this is just taking that and and kind of putting a little bit of a bookend on that that one end of it like no but for reals don't write what you don't know because <laughs> it's not just write what you know it's it's specifically don't like say veer into a lane that you haven't checked and make sure it's okay to be in yeah you know and and that makes perfect sense you know i'm, I'm thinking about uh you know i've got a an idea percolating for a fantasy game i want to be running at some mm -hmm. point for D D. and as i think about it it's like okay this could potentially be this really epic, sweeping fantasy story, and that's a very ambitious thing to think about. And I'm, I'm mulling it over like, okay, well, if I do that, um, and I'm trying to involve different cultures within this fantasy world, which, by the nature of D&D and, and Tolkien-esque fantasy, are going to be certain reflections of real-world cultures, I want to make sure... He means European <laughs> Not always. I mean, there's there's a lot of... I'm kidding. Well, yeah. <laughs> but even then, you know, it's like, well, I don't know a lot of the nuances of Eastern European cultures. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, a lot of how, you know, French culture is, you know, handles a lot of things. I'm learning a lot more about French culture lately. But um, there's, there's all kinds of European stereotypes that... Er, st stereotypes and archetypes that are easy to fall into that a lot of... Yeah. Yeah, that a lot of a lot of not just Tolkien esque but also D and D <laughs> fantasy is based on, mm -hmm. and you know, they're they're written in broad strokes. Dwarves are Northern European, Scandinavian, or, uh, or German, or yeah. Scottish, or you know, whatever. Like okay, dwarves are kind of they're hill and mountain folk, yeah, they, or yeah. hillbillies as yeah. we were calling you know, them in America. You know. Yeah, not always. They're often very refined, but you get that like kind of <laughs> Northern European. You know, the French are going to be the more you know petite and refined. Your your uh, maybe Spaniards, French, Italian. Uh, you know the oh the very high culture sorts who are more interested in the upper economic class. Yeah, not just the upper economic class, but the entire cultures where they value that. Mm -hmm. Even the poor people value the aesthetics more highly than okay. um, you know than other cultures. You know, so you, you get these broad strokes where they're pulling from European cultures and put them into entire races that are like that. Mm -hmm. And 
that's all well and good, again, so long as you have... And Bright still sucked. <laughs> Go yeah, on. Yeah, well... <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Bright is just a story that I wish I could have rewritten. Um, <laughs> like, Bright could have been an amazing Shadowrun story, and they just didn't. Yeah. They just yeah, didn't. I know. I um, know. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you, you get um, these these fantasy cultures that are pulling heavily from real world cultures and if you're going to represent them well in your story I think it's wise to recognize and, and uh, identify where they're from in the real world and also to make sure you have enough understanding of that real world culture that you can do justice to the fantasy version of it. Or at least enough of the aspect that you're trying to show. Yeah. Um, I, I thought about running a pirate game except I don't like water. Um, <laughs> but here's one of the things that I know. Um, you know, I do have a shady past, and I can write a very good thief. I can write a very good street urchin because I understand what makes a thief. I know what makes a street urchin. Um, I know what makes a scholar. Yeah. I don't know what makes someone... Um, I don't know how legacy wealth thinks. Mm. But my girlfriend does. Um because last week we caught up with Steven Universe. Yeah. Um, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I was going to say, like, yeah. If you had, ooh. And um, my girlfriend, you know, my, my hobbit back there, she'd never met White Diamond. And when I showed oh. her the scene where Steven meets White Diamond, she's like, oh, White Diamond's a debutante. I'm like, well? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, okay. Yeah. And she's like, wait, this show is written by a woman and has major... Okay, this 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 writer has a very powerful mother who was very emotionally distant, and I'm yep. like, go on, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Let, uh, show me a little bit of this stuff, and if I end up writing characters that have that, I can think of my girlfriend's relationship with that world from my perspective, and here's the second part: I can let her read it and show me where I have made missteps. Yeah. You know, this is why it's important for writers and the creatives to have a diverse, um, a, a diverse stable of friends and family. You know, because those of us who tell the stories have got to understand the stories that we're telling. So, um, if you know, I don't need to know white people. Right. If I'm writing a thief story, I need to understand thieves so much that whoever is a thief became a thief. For exactly the same reason, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Which is, you know, <clears throat> there's the rebel thief where, haha, I'm rich and I'm going to do something for the thrill of it, but eventually that costs them everything and now they're doing it for necessity. Yeah. And if I write a story about thieves that starts at necessity, doesn't matter why you need it, doesn't matter how you came to need, but if the story is about being a thief because you have that necessity. I can focus on that and not offend people. Yeah. You know, I, I or more to the point, I can focus on that and not insult people. Yeah. And that yeah. is, you know, and that that's really what all this stuff is for. So sometimes archetypes, kids, can be offensive, but I have yet to see a time where a stereotype wasn't insulting, you yeah. know, and as storytellers and if you're running a game... You don't want to insult your friends. You know, you don't like, okay, they're screwing around and saying things that would normally be insulting, but they're not insulting because the person knows you're joking and blah, blah, blah. And then there's insults. <laughs> you know, where insults, being insulted doesn't mean you know they're joking or you don't know that they're joking. It doesn't matter because it's not a good joke. You know, it is a harmful thing. And again, more to the point, if you don't know whether or not they're serious, it's insulting. <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. Because um, that's where the insult has come. If they're not serious, it can still be insulting. If you don't know if they're not serious, it's more insulting. <laughs> you know, it's not binary, yeah. but there's a certain place on the scale that it doesn't cross over. So yeah, that, that's, that's where we go. So just um, just to sum up, Stereotype is an insulting box that everything stops at. It is a blocking thing. Be it um, Asian store owner, um, elves are good at magic, 
um, Asians are good at math, black people are angry and uneducated, um, people that grew up in trailer parks are on crystal meth and incestuous, um, Native orcs Americans. Orcs are all evil barbarians. Yeah, orcs are evil barbarians. Yeah. Um, what, what are some, what are some other, um, stereotypes, um, yeah, I said trailer park people are crystal meth. Native Americans are alcoholics. Yeah. You know, Irish people like to fight. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You can start with those. Yeah. Okay, you can start there. They like to fight. Now, why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're alcoholics. Why? Let's delve in to where the alcoholism comes from, um, how it affects their lives, what effects that it has on them, and where they go from there. Right. Okay? And if you start... With a, with a stereotype and expand on it and learn more and teach more, then it becomes an archetype. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know. Where yeah, and, and treated yeah. respectfully, I think, is the is the key there. I know? don't really like using terms like that because people, you know the age that we live in. As yeah. soon as people hear a good word, they latch on to that good word in a very stereotypical manner, yeah. and that's all they hear. Yeah. You know, this is why I'm going in depth on that good people can do bad things. True. But you don't stop being good unless you, your follow up is lackluster right. consistently. You know, that's kind of the difference between Bojack Horseman and Captain America. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, or even Bojack Horseman, and I hate to say it, Iron Man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And. Part of what makes, especially the current Marvel Cinematic Universe, so compelling mm -hmm. is that they, they've been treating these characters very well, and they're not, you know, we're getting to see more nuance where, you know, you start out with the stereotype mm -hmm. of, you know, Iron Man as the billionaire industrialist who, you know, okay, well, he's, you know, starting from there, we're going to go ahead and build him out, so, well, okay, he's still a billionaire industrialist, but now he's trying to do the right thing, and... They've really taken that character and gone, okay, no, this is not just who he is. We're not stopping at he's a billionaire industrialist. We're going to like really dig into how he thinks and feels and where he, where he wants to see the world, what he's willing to do to get there, uh, how he starts to you know, take, uh, you know, take stock of what his role as the, um, you know, the head of this company is doing for the world and to the world. And, you know, you get to see what, uh, you know, PTSD does to someone. You get to, you know, you really start to dig into this character where he's not just a billionaire industrialist and that's his character mm -hmm. and all of his stuff is based around that. Huh? Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, well, I want to thank you because believe it or not, that's our time. Yeah. That is our all time. All right. Yeah. Well, so. it's been a good show. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, I feel like uh, we talked a good about conversation. Good stuff. Very good conversation. Um, it's funny. My mentor hates podcasts that are just conversations he likes more <laughs> of a talk show thing. and i'm like just listen to the conversation we're about inclusion and you know that yeah. kind of thing. but yeah so um and i want to thank you guys for showing up um thank all you guys over in np city what's Ooh. going on Ooh. and with that i'm gonna say you know thank you guys for coming up thank you guys for checking out the twitch stream Thank all of you new guys that have been um, checking us out over on YouTube. And um, if you guys have any questions or anything like that and want to come to us with those things, I'm going to make that very easy for you. All you got to do is pull up your keyboard, open up your email, even if it's NetZero or Yahoo or even <laughs> America Online, because there's hell, I still have a Hotmail account. And hit us up at backinthedeck at gmail.com. That's B-A-C-K-I-N-T-H-E-D-E-C-K -E -E at gmail.com. And that way you can send us an email and all that jazz. And guess what? what we actually return emails within a couple of hours believe it or not because that is how dedicated we are to keeping the lines open and making sure that you guys not just feel included but are included in what we do um check out our archive over at youtube just do a search for bid space p just for back in the deck productions and that'll take you to our youtube page follow us on twitter at back in the deck that's the at sign with b-a-c-k-i-n-t-h-e-d-e-c-k -E -E um join our group deckers on the book um on facebook if you're part of that terrible hive of scum and villainy as you guys know i am and that's where you can talk to us about your gaming experience or your painting or your writing or anything that you do that makes you a geek and yeah i am looking for people to help represent the anime side of things um 
But, you know, more time and all that stuff. And, of course, listen to our archive over on SoundCloud. Um, SoundCloud.com slash BID underscore P. And you'll be able to check out seven years of back conversations about games, about building games, running games, stores, writing comic books, um, you know, making movies. We're just, we're all over the place with our nerd culture. And, of course, follow us on the Instagram. Um, Just look for Back in the Deck on Instagram. Instagram and you will see our logo with a red background for those of you guys that really want to help us out and help us keep the door open man would I appreciate it if you guys head over to patreon.com slash bid underscore p and become a patron help us out on that one for as little as a dollar a month you can help um we've got a lot of slots open for the 10 and 20 dollar a month people and if you are out there looking just to be an angelic benefactor i will let you know we do have a tier that's worth 100 bucks a month and you get a whole lot of really good stuff going on that so um, once again, Doug, thank you for showing up today. Absolutely, man. It was a good conversation. Yeah, very good conversation. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. And um, and again, I'm Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer. And if anybody tells you guys that you can't have the hobbies you like because of the circumstances of your birth, be it race, religion, creed, gender identity, sexual orientation, your disability, or your budget, you just tell them that we said to take those cards and put them back in the deck. Um, look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow on Buster Recap.